O God, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. you have seen me, Thomas, you have believed. Blessed are they who have not seen me and yet believe. Alleluia. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the loneliness of his hand.
you have seen me, Thomas, you have believed. Blessed are they who have not seen me and yet believe. Alleluia. Regina Celi, let Good evening, everyone, as we uh, join together once more in praying the Word of God in the ancient uh, practice of Lectio Divina, divine reading. And it is something which is uh, meant to be done mainly in private. In our own private time of prayer, we read over the Word of God, preferably aloud, which is one of the benefits we have at the liturgy. We read the, the, the Word of God aloud, and that way it comes not only to our eyes, but to our ears and to our whole body. Uh, and that's uh, what I suggest doing when reading um, the, the scriptures day by day, uh, to do that, to just read it aloud if possible. If you're in a place where you might bother someone by reading it aloud, then charity dictates uh, turn off the sound but still voice it. Um, I've, I think I mentioned different occasions that I once got some wise advice from a, a person I met at a, a, one of these social gatherings that I go to as part of my duty. And uh, he simply said that every day he spends 30 minutes reading the Word of God. And normally that could be, I think what he had in mind was just simply starting and keep on going every day, being immersed in the Word of God. That's continuous reading of scripture. It's a very good idea because what that does is it 
uh, gives us a sense of the whole. And that's particularly important as we look at uh, our participation in the Holy Liturgy, because of course they're just little sections taken here and there. Another way, of course, of reading the Word of God is uh, liturgical reading, which we do at Mass in the lectionary. But even there, if you look at the references, you sometimes see chapter three, verses four to eight, 11 to something, you always wonder where are the missing verses because it's taken small little pieces. So the benefit is as part of the, the Holy Eucharist, uh, that can't be replaced. And it's also read aloud in the community. And we pray also that it would have a, a commentary by the priest to, to relate it to life and to the life in Christ. Uh, but it is, um, it's a beneficial to read the whole Bible slowly and you know, from cover to cover or in different books. But this is, uh, and also it's sometimes we have strange things as we certainly do in the Psalm 18 tonight. Uh, it's good to get a little background. And so uh, that's why we need commentaries and study of the language and the text and so on. That's exegesis, the drawing out of the meaning from the text. Keeping in mind that God, the word became flesh 2000 years ago in our Lord in Nazareth in, in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth and then to Jerusalem, the holy city. Uh, and speaking a language, it's not our own. But the word became flesh in a sense also in language in the time of the Old Testament and also in the time of the New Testament. And so we need to go to a different place and a different time. For that, we sometimes need help. And that's where we study commentaries and people who spend their lives spending years and years studying the word of God. I am forever grateful to people of Hamilton Diocese uh, who paid for five years of my life in Rome, studying at the Pontifical Biblical Institute and then at the Gregorian University to spend all that time in deeply studying the Word of God in many different portions. But, and I've tried for the rest of my life, and now that's many years ago, I'm 74 now, I've tried to devote the rest of my life to, in a sense, repaying the people of the church through service by, speaking of God's word and trying to make use of what I learned in those days. But this is different. This isn't continuous reading. It isn't liturgical reading. It isn't study. It's not a lesson in sacred scripture. It's prayer. It's the slow praying of the word of God. And that's something which really is what it's Lectio Divina means. And so normally we take a very small piece of the scriptures, no more than about five or 10, maybe 15 verses, and pray them slowly, lovingly, reflecting, speak Lord, your servant is listening. And every time we encounter a piece of scripture, it encounters a different us, because we're different every day, every moment. And so God is always the same, and his word is the same in its fundamental purpose. But when we encounter the Lord through sacred scriptures, we do this at different times of our life, and every time we do that, God speaks to us with a deeper resonance about our own, where we are in our life, in our journey towards the Heavenly Father. So we pray, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. But it's Lectio Divina means that kind of quiet, simple prayer. The prayer this evening is Psalm 18 that we're going to be meditating upon. And the text is found in the handouts. So it's also available on the uh, you know, uh, virtually on the, the, the website or whatever, on uh, YouTube. But um, the difficulty tonight is I'm not gonna be able to pray the whole Psalm, uh, at least not be able to meditate upon it because it's very long. It's over 50 verses, which is long for a Psalm. But it's such a beautiful Psalm and I want to enter into it. And I think it's just, uh, so I'll pray about half of it. I might have, I might sneak in at the end if we have time, just read the rest of it without going into it in detail, without taking time to really deeply pray it. But it's, a, it's fairly long. It's a very old Psalm. Uh, some of the Psalms were written after the exile in Babylon. Some were written during the exile, as for example, by the waters of Babylon. Um, we know that David, King David was a singer of the songs of Israel. So all the Psalms, everything musical in, uh, the Old Testament is attributed to David because he certainly did write Psalms. He may have written this Psalm for all we know because it goes way, way, way back. It's very ancient Hebrew. All the wisdom literature we attribute to, Mo, uh, to Solomon and all the laws to Moses. 
So they are the great, the lawgiver, the wise one, and the singer of the songs of Israel. Now this one really does go back quite far. And it speaks of the warrior and his struggles. And certainly we think of uh, David as the great warrior, uh, dealing with all kinds of problems and cares, destruction, especially the danger of death that surrounded him, the enemies that surrounded him. And as with everything in the book of Psalms, what we need to do is to take the dramatic, majestic, divinely inspired words and humanly inspired too, in the sense that they're powerful, and then say to ourselves, what in my life is similar to this? When we hear the waves of death rose about me, a torrent of destruction assailed me. When have I felt that way? Do I experience that now? We think of the number of people now in this terrible pandemic who are losing their jobs or who are facing death, literal death, or who are facing uh, the stress and the care of being taken away from those they love. That can indeed be the waves of death arose about me, the torrents of destruction assailed me. And that intense anguish, which is expressed so powerfully in the Psalm, is poured into the cup of our own life whenever we pray the Psalms. And that's what makes them so wonderful. And it may be, I don't feel that way. Maybe things are going well. In that case, I know of someone for whom these words require no imagination. They speak of there's maybe someone I know, maybe I know of someone who in this time of affliction is facing grievous, grievous suffering. And so I pray the Psalm not for myself, but for them. I offer it for them. And that's really what our Lord did on the cross. He entered into our world. He lived our life. He did this for us. And he prayed Psalm 22 as we prayed last month in that spirit. And so this Psalm is a very ancient one and it is found in the divine office in the office of readings, which is not found in every breviary you get for those who pray the divine office. It's in the full breviary. It's also in the one volume breviary. Uh, and uh, I recommend praying the divine office. Uh, the priests make a, a commitment to do so when we're ordained deacons. Office of readings, morning prayer, midday prayer, evening prayer, which we've just done here, and night prayer. But many, many, many lay people pray uh, some part of the divine office and uh, they might very well pray this psalm. And I'll tell a little joke about it at, at a certain point in here, when I gave my very first retreat on the psalms. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a bit about that. That can come later. Anyway, enough, enough. We'll do the, the first part of it is Office of Readings, week one on Wednesday. And the next day, Thursday of week one of the four weeks of the Psalter, it's Office of Readings, week one on Thursday. So the whole psalm is so long, they split it over two days, if one is referring to the, to the divine office. So let's now enter into this time of prayer and up introduction and uh, pray to the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, we ask you to bless us, send your Holy Spirit upon us, that we may hear your word, listen with our hearts, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Take away from me, O Lord, all those distractions and all the sins that block the pathway to my heart, that with an attentive mind and heart, I may listen to your word. And I may, I may see what you are saying to me, what you are saying to my head that I might know you, to my heart that I might love you, to my hands that I might serve you. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I love you, Lord, my strength, my rock, my fortress, my savior, my God is the rock where I take refuge, my shield, my mighty help, my stronghold, 
The Lord is worthy of all praise. When I call, I am saved from my foes. The waves of death rose about me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The snares of the grave entangled me. The traps of death confronted me. In my anguish, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came to his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The mountains were shaken to their base. They reeled at his terrible anger. Smoke came forth from his nostrils, the scorching fire from his mouth. Coals were set ablaze by its heat. He lowered the heavens and came down, a black cloud under his feet. He came and throned on the cherubim. He flew on the wings of the wind. He made the darkness his covering, the dark waters of the clouds his tent. A brightness shone out from him with hailstones and flashes of fire. The Lord thundered in the heavens. The Most High let his voice be heard. He shot his arrows, scattered the foe, flashed his lightnings, and put them to flight. The bed of the ocean was revealed. The foundations of the world were laid bare. At the thunder of your threat, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your anger, from on high he reached down and seized me. He drew me forth from the mighty waters. He snatched me from my powerful foe, from my enemies whose strength I could not match. They assailed me in the day of my misfortune, but the Lord was my support. He brought me forth into freedom. He saved me because he loved me. He rewarded me because I was just, repaid me for my hands were clean. For I have kept the way of the Lord and have not fallen away from my God. For his judgments are all before me. I have never neglected his commands. I have always been upright before him. I have kept myself from guilt. He repaid me because I was just and my hands were clean in his eyes. You are loving with those who love you. You show yourself perfect with the perfect. With the sincere, you show yourself sincere, but the cunning you outdo in cunning. For you save a humble people, but humble the eyes that are proud. You, O Lord, are my lamp, my God, who lightens my darkness. With you, I can break through any barrier. With my God, I can scale any wall. And that is the first portion of Psalm 18. The next portion, which I don't think we'll have time to go into this evening, uh, is uh, for the rest of the, to the end of the Psalm, is prayed on Thursday of week one in the divine office. I'll tell you my little joke about this last line here. When I was just newly ordained, well, not a few years ordained, I, had, I was asked to give a retreat for priests. And I thought, I haven't the faintest idea what I could say to a bunch of seasoned pastors who've been serving the Lord so many years. I was just very newly ordained. What could I possibly say to them? And yet I was asked to do so to the priests of Regina in Saskatchewan. So I thought, I know what I can do. I don't know much about being a pastor. I don't know anything. I'd never been a pastor. But I do know about literature. I do know about poetry because when I was earlier on, I studied a couple of degrees in English, an MA in English when I was in the seminary. So I knew poetry, I knew language. And I also had spent three years in the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome where I had obtained a licentiate. So I had studied scripture, especially the Psalms. So I thought, you know, what I can do to help these priests is to help them pray the divine office because every priest is promises at his ordination as a deacon that for the rest of his life until he dies, he will pray morning prayer or readings, morning prayer, midday prayer, evening prayer, night prayer, 
for the people he serves. Just as every priest or bishop on Sunday offers mass for all the people, Misa Pro Populo, as I did at noon today. So he promises to pray for the people. So I thought, well, that's what I'll do. I will give a retreat on the Psalms. And since then, I've given dozens and dozens of them to many different people. I, I, it has been an enormous blessing in my own life as I've entered more deeply into the Psalms. But anyway, I gave this retreat and I, I thought Psalm 18 would be good. And I just, this is what we just, I just read right here. With you, I can break through any barrier. With my God, I can scale any wall. And so I said to the priests of Regina, so many, many years ago, I bet that on Wednesday morning, the doors of all the rectories in the diocese of Regina fling open, and the priests have just finished the divine office. They leap out and say, with you, I can break through any barrier. With my God, I can scale any wall. I think it's appropriate to have that on a Wednesday morning, in the middle of the week, when we're all getting kind of weighed down. And we trust in the midst of our struggles. This is important. We trust that the Lord gives us strength. You, O Lord, are my lamp. Not my own strength. You, O Lord, are my lamp. My God who lightens my darkness. With you, I can break through any barrier. Think of the barriers we face so many. With my God, I can scale any wall. So I made those remarks, and I made a joke about the priests of Regina leaping through the doors, ready to take on the day. And the Archbishop of Regina, after and during the coffee break after that presentation, he said, you were, that reminds me of a story I told, I heard once. There was a big vat of whiskey, and a little tiny mouse slipped in and fell into the vat of whiskey. He swam around and around, and finally he worked his way out. As he slid down the other side, he said, bring on the cats. So that may be, I don't think that's maybe the most profound message from this psalm, but it is the spirit that with God on our side, what can we fear? And yet we have many things that we do fear. And that's what this psalm is about, just as Psalm 22 is as well. Remember the psalm of our Lord on the cross? We all know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But as we prayed it last, last month, we could see that it ends off with, with my God, I can scale any wall. It ends off with these things the Lord has done. In other words, it begins with the crucifixion and it ends with the resurrection. And that's why I think maybe it's appropriate on this resurrection day, because today is the, the Sunday within the octave of Easter. It is Easter repeated. On this resurrection day, this Easter day, we recognize that on our own, we're like the huddled apostles, afraid, anguished, hiding, facing so many barriers, so many walls, so many things. And yet with God, we can scale these barriers. He comes to reach down where we're struggling. When the waves of death overwhelm us, he's there to help us. And we in our mission need to reach out to and help those who are in need. And so it is in our life. That's why I think it's one of the great, a very great thing, important thing in our life to pray the Psalms. Because, and if a good way of doing it is by praying some part of the divine office. Because as we do that, we get out of ourselves, our own little ego. And we think of those who are in anguish when we are in joy, or those who are in joy when we are in anguish. We stretch out of that and we become more supple instruments of God's grace. We recognize it's not all about me. It's not all ego. We need to go beyond ourselves and we need to know where we find our help. And it's not in the things when we face anguish and care. It's not in work that we find our help, productivity. It's not in drugs and alcohol. It's not in promiscuity. It's not in all the things, popularity, whatever, wealth, whatever. It's not in any of those things that we find the way out of our anguish when we're facing it. We find our way by going deeper and reaching out like Peter 
on the stormy waters, reaching out to Jesus. And we begin to sink when we think of ourselves. So maybe as we pray this psalm, we can think in our own life. Let's just do that now as we start into it. What are the, what is the thing in my own life which for me is a wave of death, for me is anguish, for me is a struggle, a barrier, a wall that needs to be scaled. Let's just offer that to the Lord through whose strength I can break through any barrier and scale any wall. Let's just offer that to the Lord. I love you, Lord, my strength. My rock, my fortress, my savior, my God is the rock where I take refuge. My shield, my mighty help, my stronghold. The Lord is worthy of all praise. When I call, I am saved from my foes. This vigorous psalm, the psalm of majesty, with thunder and lightning and God and glory, it begins with, I love you. I love you, Lord, my strength, my rock, my fortress, my savior. Strength, rock, fortress, solid. I love you, we say to the Lord. My savior, we use savior so often that we forget what it means. It means rescuer. It means the lifeguard who dives in to save us when we're drowning, the firefighter who rushes through the burning building to pull us out. It's not just a vague word. It's been made that by overuse. My rescuer, my savior. And it is what is meant by Jesus. Rescuer Christ. Rescuer, the anointed one who is our rescuer, is Christ Jesus, our king, our prophet, our Lord. I love you, Lord, my strength, my rock, my fortress, my savior. We think of this in our relationship with God. And I think we've had a beautiful reminder of this in our own personal lives as a model for it in these recent days with the death of Prince Philip. The beautiful words that Queen Elizabeth said a while ago, all these years, he, my husband, Philip, has been my strength and my stay all these years. And I don't know, what was it, 70 something, three or four years of marriage together? Amazing. All those years, she looked to her husband as her strength and stay. And so as we look at this to the Lord God, we also look to one another. We are called, as we call on the Lord to help us, we also realize we can be for others a strength, a rock, a fortress, a savior, a rescuer. May we be that more often. May we be that for 74 years. May we do that. I mean, we might try to pull it off for a couple of minutes, but to do that, that relationship, that human level, which is so beautiful as we look at Her Majesty's relationship and marriage with Prince Philip, that's just, amazing and edifying. But here we see how ultimately, of course, as, as she is a profoundly devoted disciple of our Lord Jesus, as was Prince Philip, we see this now in relationship to the Lord. I love you, Lord, my strength, my rock, my fortress, my savior. Strength, rock, and fortress are sturdy, but savior is dynamic. And we see here solidity, we need that, like the rock of Peter, but we need also the dynamic assistance of the Lord. My God is the rock where I take refuge. So often we hear in the Psalms, you know, in these wadis, these narrow kind of valleys, you would be walking along in this dry thing and suddenly this roaring sound as the waves or the, the, the flash flood comes roaring along. And some of the Psalms speak of God lifts me up out of the roaring waters, <gasps> puts me on a rock, 
a refuge, my shield, my mighty help, my stronghold. We are in a world where we need that. All of us do. We need that. Some people do physically. We think of the massacres going on. We think of the injustices in some countries, people being enslaved. We think of that, but also in our own individual. Sometimes it's not a dramatic thing. Sometimes it's the fears that surround us. We can become enslaved within our own hearts. And then we need to find refuge. The Lord is worthy of all praise. When I call, I am saved from my foes. To think there are no foes is to live in Never Never Land. And that's just dangerous. We gotta have cast a cold eye on life, on death. We're not called to be naive. Remember the sign of our faith is a cross. Nothing more realistic and sharp and clear than the cross of Jesus Christ. Our hope is in the fire of the light of the resurrection. But we do so from within the valley of tears. The waves of death rose about me, the torrents of destruction assailed me, the snares of the grave entangled me, the traps of death confronted me. How often do we find a feeling of being surrounded, being pressed in? Look at Psalm 32, where sin is pressing, pressing in, surrounding, and then finally, the psalmist is surrounded by cries of deliverance and rescue. We, we can be pressed in, so we feel we have nowhere to move. I have no choice. We always have a choice, and that is to surrender our lives to the Lord. But we can feel that, and that's an oppressive thing. We can feel the pressure of regret at what we have done in the past, but we can't change it, it's done. And yet it can be a wall that's squeezing us, pressing in, or the fear of what might happen in the future. The whole of the present can be absorbed by lamenting the past and fearing the future. And then we really are pressed in. We really do need to cry out to be free. In my anguish, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple he heard my voice. My cry came to his ears, as always it does. Let's think now again. What are the things in my life? Something I'm facing right now, perhaps? A worry that is consuming me? A relationship, perhaps, that has gone sour? that I need to find how to deal with. A decision I have to make, perhaps, or some form of suffering, maybe physical, maybe mental, that I'm dealing with in this valley of tears. And so I call to the Lord, I cry to my God for help. So in our own hearts, let's cry to the Lord for help for whatever it is, and we're all different, every one of us, and we're different at different times of our life. That's why the Psalms are so wonderful. Then the earth reeled and rocked, the mountains were shaken to their base. They reeled at his terrible anger. Smoke came forth from his nostrils, scorching fire from his mouth. Coals were set ablaze by its heat. He lowered the heavens and came down, a black cloud under his feet. He came and throned on the cherubim. He flew on the wings of the wind. He made the darkness his covering, the dark waters of the clouds his tent. A brightness shone out from before him with hailstones and flashes of fire. The Lord thundered in the heavens. The Most High let his voice be heard. He shot his arrows, scattered the foe, flashed his lightnings, and put them to flight. The bed of the ocean was revealed. The foundations of the world were laid bare. 
at the thunder of your threat, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your anger. Oh my, there. We cry out to the Lord who loves us as we love the Lord. I love you, Lord, my rock, my strength. And we hear short, soon after this how God saves us because he loves us. But the Lord God who loves us is the Lord God. That's what we think of especially on this celebration of Easter today, on this the eighth day of Easter, the octave of Easter, the majesty of God the glory of our Lord Jesus. That's why we use all those glorious gold investments in this Easter time, to remind us that we are frail, that he is our Lord and God. As Thomas says in today's gospel, reflecting in a sense the majesty of this Psalm, he sees the wounds of Christ, which are his intimate closeness to us, his reaching down into the place of our anguish, but he sees the majesty of Jesus the Lord. And he says, my Lord and my God. In anguish, we see his majesty. That vision of the glory of the Lord is what helps us to be strong, not in ourselves, but through the power and the grace of God and to experience that refuge and strength in the midst of this valley of tears. And that's why until he comes again in glory, we are so attentive to the words of sacred scripture, which draw us to see that the scales may fall from the eyes of our hearts and the experience of the sacraments when we now experience an encounter with the risen Lord, who is not only close to us in his intimacy, for he is wounded with the pain and the suffering of the cross, but he is majestic in majesty as these words of this song prefigure. It's just like what we see in the book of Revelation or the apocalypse, which I spend a good part of my life meditating upon. We see the lamb slain upon the throne. The lamb upon the throne is slain. In other words, it is the suffering, death and resurrection. Those are all together. And that's why we in this holy time from Holy Week to the octave of Easter go through that all so that it may be imprinted on our consciousness. We may realize that. And that's why when people are afflicted as so many are, especially in these days of pandemic and death, the waves of death rose about me, the torrents of destruction assailed me, the snares of the grave entangled me, the traps of death confronted me. That speaks powerfully and really. In these days, we need to come to the Lord for our strength. And maybe this time we can sometimes have of many things being stripped away can draw us more to that, or they can just make us angry, in which case, tempers fray, everything goes wrong, and that's no solution. And more and more people are drawn to spend time in adoration before our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament. For here is the glory and the majesty, the fire. And here is the risen Lord present amongst us sacramentally in the Holy Eucharist as he is most fully when we celebrate the Holy Eucharist my Lord and my God. That's where we find strength in the battle of life. And so, with all that majesty, from on high he reached down and seized me. He drew me forth from the mighty waters, like Peter being lifted up by Jesus. He snatched me from my powerful foe, 
for my enemies whose strength I could not match. They assailed me in the day of my misfortune, but the Lord was my support. He brought me forth into freedom. He saved me because he loved me. And there we are. He saved me because he loved me. Amazing. And then we have a description which, depending on how we read it, can seem a bit uh, pharisaical, you might say, or a bit uh, dubious if we read it that way, but I don't think we need to. We have the psalmist is pointing out that he's following God's law. That's, he tries to respond and call on the Lord by living rightly, which we all should do. The problem would be if we do that and start becoming pompous or saying, I'm perfect, you know. Although Psalm 26, which very much expands upon all this, was used by St. Teresa of Avila when she spoke of the way of perfection, which is very much not uh, arrogant or anything. So we just have to recognize, I think what he is saying here is that we need to have our life be right. We need to, in all our sinfulness, which is another theme we find in the penitential psalms, but not so much here, we need, with all humility, which we also don't find here so much, we need to act rightly. Remember what the Lord Jesus says when the woman caught in adultery is brought before him. He acts with mercy. He says, go, I will not condemn you. Who am I to judge? But he also says, and sin no more. That's why when we receive the mercy of God through the sacrament of reconciliation, we make a purpose of amendment. I sometimes, when somebody doesn't know an act of contrition, I say, well, just repeat after me. Oh my God, I'm sorry for my sins, and with your help, I'll try not to sin again. That's pretty well puts it together in one brief line. And so now there is a certain responsibility, and this is what he speaks of here. He rewarded me because I was just, repaid me for my hands were clean, for I have kept the way of the Lord and have not fallen away from my God. The way, remember Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, we need to keep the way of the Lord. We need to act, it's not enough to say, Lord, Lord, we need to act rightly. For his judgments are all before me. I have never neglected his commands. I have always been upright before him. I have kept myself from guilt. Well, that's good. That may be our goal, but I think we also recognize as in the penitential Psalms, we don't always do that. He repaid me because I was just and my hands were clean in his eyes. You are loving with those who love you. You show yourself perfect with the perfect. With the sincere, you show yourself sincere, but the cunning you outdo in cunning. For you, you save a humble people, but humble the eyes that are proud. I think the psalmist needs to take that line and move it further back to be sure we get the humility part, because I think he's verging here. I, and this is something about the psalms. Some of them we put on the wall in posters and make in little prayer cards because they teach us what we should be. But that's not all the scriptures are for. The scriptures are also to reveal us, to us, who we are. And when we find in the Psalms, which we often do, violence or hatred or a little bit of arrogance, you might say, it's not that God is telling us to do that. It is God is saying, I'm flicking on the light here. Take a look and see what you see and learn from it. So sometimes the Psalms are clearly meant for us to imitate and move in that direction. Other times they are meant to reveal to us maybe some of the, uh, you know, flick over the rock and see what's underneath. That's also what they do. And I think it's a bit of that here. You, O Lord, are my lamp, my God, who lightens my darkness. With you, I can break through any barrier. With my God, I can scale any wall. And so, there we are. This is only half of Psalm 18, but 
we're near the end right now, and I obviously we, I suggest you read the rest of it. And if you're praying the divine office on Wednesday of week one, you an office of readings, you get the, this part. Thursday, the next day, you get the next part. So you get it all in two days. This psalm is profound, it's ancient and powerful. It speaks to us of the love of God for us and our love for God. It speaks to us of life as a battle, which it truly is. If we don't think it is, we're naive. There's no room for naivety in this world, too dangerous. You can't drive down the 401 with a blanket over the windshield, it's not, not healthy. So we gotta see, see the world, see the glory of God, see the struggles we face, and also maybe, and that's the last part of this, see our own arrogance and the way we can get a little too caught up in ourselves. But always to see the fact that the Lord God is with us in the struggle, lifts us up. So I will pray this to end this time of prayer. And as I do so, just I think each one of us, including myself, should try as I'm praying this to put into it mix in with it, our own situation now. What does it say to my head to know God, my heart to love God, and my hand to serve God? How does it challenge me? How does it console me? I love you, Lord, my strength, my rock, my fortress, my savior. My God is the rock where I take refuge, my shield, my mighty help, my stronghold. The Lord is worthy of all praise. When I call, I am saved from my foes. The waves of death rose about me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The snares of the grave entangled me. The traps of death confronted me. In my anguish, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. His cry, my cry came to his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The mountains were shaken by their, to their base. They reeled at his terrible anger. Smoke came forth from his nostrils and scorching fire from his mouth. Coals were set ablaze by its heat. He lowered the heavens and came down, a black cloud under his feet. He came and throned on the cherubim. He flew on the wings of the wind. He made the darkness his covering, the dark waters of the clouds his tent. A brightness shone out before him with hailstones and flashes of fire. The Lord thundered in the heavens, the Most High let his voice be heard. He shot his arrows, scattered the foe, flashed his lightnings and put them to flight. The bed of the ocean was revealed, the foundations of the world were laid bare. At the thunder of your threat, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your anger. From on high, he reached down and seized me. He drew me forth from the mighty waters. He snatched me from my powerful foe, from my enemies whose strength I could not match. They assailed me in the day of my misfortune, but the Lord was my support. He brought me forth into freedom he saved me because he loved me. He rewarded me because I was just, repaid me for my heart, my hands were clean. For I have kept the way of the Lord and have not fallen away from my God. For his judgments are all before me. I have never neglected his commands. I've always been upright before him. I have kept myself from guilt. He repaid me because I was just and my hands were clean in his eyes. You are loving with those who love you. You show yourself perfect with the perfect. With the sincere, you show yourself sincere, but the cunning you will do in cunning. For you save a humble people, but humble the eyes that are proud. You, O Lord, are my lamp, my God, who lightens my darkness. With you, I can break through any barrier. With my God, I can scale any wall. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.